Stanford University. Welcome to the panel on building energy and, and carbon management. Um, we have the fortune of having one less speaker than the other panels, which means we'll actually get a chance to discuss some things and have, and have some good interaction. Um, so uh, I am Mike Lepic. I am a uh, faculty member in civil and environmental engineering. You'll hear some more about my research here shortly because I'm both a presenter and the moderator for this panel. Um, we were asked to start the panels with a little bit of framing of why we think that this is an important panel for this, uh, for, for this conference. And in my opinion, the built environment is of extreme importance to addressing the global climate change. I actually don't see a pathway to addressing global climate change without thinking about buildings, infrastructure, and carbon management. So the built environment, including construction, is responsible for about 40% of global carbon emissions. And that's why I say there is no pathway without our without our, our session. Now these are made up of building operations. So of course that includes the energy production sector because we need energy to operate our buildings and we'll hear more about that. That's about 28% of global CO2 emissions. And the production of building and building related materials is about another 21% of global CO2 emissions. So of course that relates to steel, that relates to concrete, that relates to asphalt, that relates to many other things that we use to build the world around us. And I would say that no other economic sector when considered as a whole looms so large in our global climate and sustainability challenge. Uh, this is a comprehensive interconnected industry that uses materials and energy that are sourced from all over the world. And so addressing this will be uh, will be a big challenge. And I'm so glad that each of you has joined us this morning in order to try to think about this. I'm also glad that our other two panelists have joined us this morning to help us think about this. <clears throat> so uh, to my immediate uh, right, Jacques de Chanlard is an independent research consultant at Stanford for Total Energies and an adjunct professor in energy science and engineering. His research draws on technical engineering, mathematical modeling, and software engineering to work on solutions across traditional disciplinary boundaries, creating mathematical models of integrated energy systems, computational tools to design and operate them in new ways, and software prototypes to conduct real-world efficiency and flexibility experiments within cyber physical systems. To his right is uh, Professor Catherine Gorley. She's an associate professor in the best department at Stanford, civil and environmental engineering. She's also an associate professor by courtesy in mechanical engineering. We won't hold that against you. And a member of ICME. Her research focuses on the development of predictive flow simulations to support the design of sustainable buildings and cities. Specifically, her areas of interest are the coupling of large and small scale models and experiments to quantify uncertainties related to variability of boundary conditions, the development of uncertainty quantification methods for low fidelity models using high fidelity data, and the use of field measurements to validate and improve computational predictions. So each one of the panelists, including myself, will get up. Um, we'll do something like 10, 15 minutes of, uh, of presentation talk as long as you like. Uh, we have some cards to give you some, some indications of when you're going to want to wrap up. If folks, be because we have a little more time than the other sessions, uh, if folks have uh, clarification questions or want to specifically ask something, you'd both be OK with uh, answering a couple of short questions during the, during the presentations. Excellent. Um, and then uh, we'll start with uh, Jacques. Then we'll go on to Catherine. And then I'll wrap up with my presentation. And hopefully by that time, we'll have some very interesting questions for discussion. For a bit of uh, framing. So the the so I'm you know I'm 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 more on the energy side of you know the energy and buildings uh, uh, discussion here and the energy systems that we uh, that we are in that we that we use are changing very quickly the that change is driven by uh, decarbonization uh, decarbonization means we want to change both the supply and the demand side of our energy systems on the supply side we want to inject large shares 
of intermittent renewables, solar and, and wind power. On the demand side, we want to electrify uh, pretty much everything uh, we can. But while we do that, we want these energy systems to meet the needs of humans who are in the center of this picture day in, day out, you know, every hour of the day, every day of the year. So we, we want to focus on buildings here. And I have two types of buildings. commercial. So here, this icon is supposed to represent commercial buildings and then residential buildings, which I grade out there. Why do I want to focus on commercial buildings? Commercial buildings, so you know, they're, they're big. They represent 35% of US electricity consumption, sort of roughly half of uh, of uh, electricity, uh, electricity consumption from uh, buildings in the US. And, and it's a bit more specific than that, what I want to focus on. I want to focus on what I call medium to large commercial buildings. Medium to large commercial buildings are those above 5,000 square feet. Why those ones? They represent half the building stock, about 3 million buildings, but 92% of the sector's energy consumption. You know, so if you think compared to residential buildings, these are much bigger buildings, you know, more buildings like the one we're in right now. I think this one is about 140,000 uh, square feet. You know, so bigger buildings, more complicated, but uh, fewer uh, decision makers than in the residential sector. And these, so I also want to say a few words about how these buildings are operated. You know, so I'll, I'll be focusing more on the operations part, the energy operations part. I was reading a, a, a report a couple days ago from, there's a new report from the US government, from the Department of Energy that came out at the beginning of the month. There, I think it's the number for the US that they were giving is 80% for operations versus uh, sort of uh, uh, embodied uh, uh, in the built environment. You know, so the, the emissions from energy operations are a, are a big deal, is what I'm saying. The, the way that these buildings are operated, you know, so they're, they're and I'm, so specifically I'm going to focus on how we heat and cool those buildings, which is roughly half, you know, is, is a big part of that energy consumption. So these buildings, the heating or the cooling uh, comes typically in the form of hot water, chilled water for the buildings I'm looking at. But hot water, chilled water can come from a district energy system like what we have at Stanford, or it can be some other part of the building. So, um, so hot water, so chilled water and hot water comes to the building. That's how the the heating and cooling comes. The uh, the the heating and cooling is passed on to the air. So the specifically the cooling, sorry, is passed on to the air in what's called the air handler, which is the uh, the this what I'm showing over here, where air is cooled down by blowing it over. Uh, coils of chilled water. It's then blown throughout the building through a central duct to uh, different zones, or which roughly correspond to rooms in which little uh, uh, boxes, dampers, control how much air, the flurry of air that goes through these zones. Some of the air is recirculated to the building. Some of the air is evacuated to the uh, outside. So the, the reason I start with this is I really want to emphasize that these commercial buildings don't function like your home, you know, your typical home or your apartment or uh, you know a house. They're they're much more complex machines. Okay, how can um, how can we you know what is the research that we're doing here? Uh, uh, how can it be useful to make to you know to turn what are I think really ideas, making um, efficient and flexible uh, commercial electricity demand, making that into a reality? How do we transition uh, uh, and how do we transition quickly? So I'm I'm. You know, I'm borrowing here on um, some a perspective I wrote last year uh, uh, with some, some researchers at the University of Michigan, North Carolina State University, where we sort of did a, a big review of our field and what were the things that we thought were open. And there are four things I want to bring to the table here. One is more experiments. So there's been a ton of work, a lot of it funded by the US government, to uh, create physics-based stimulation models of buildings. The big one in the US is called Energy Plus. But there is, there's very little data, real-world data, on energy operations available of the type that I'm going to show today. Second is we need, if we want things to go fast, you know, if we want to deploy things in the timescales that we were talking about in the in the panel just before this one, uh, we need to lower the cost of deployment. You know, we need to have scalable methods, and you know, I think that's going to mean simple things. Um, third, so focusing on operations. These, so a lot of these studies, a lot of these modeling efforts have. You know, worked really hard on construction and on design, but if we want to, uh, in a in a previous actually event here, I heard someone say we need to move from planning the transition to implementing the transition. To me, what that means is we really want to focus a lot more on operations. And then uh, fourth, you know, it, this is I see this as a strong barrier to change in, in this sector is labor costs. And one of the things that is slowing people down is this information overload. When we start to install sensors in these buildings, we get a ton of data coming at us. But how do we sort through that? How do we prioritize that information? That's another big gap. 
Okay, so uh, next, so I'm going to do two things today. I'm going to talk a bit about some experiments that we ran on buildings at Stanford, some data that we collected that go into this research agenda I just talked about, and then I'm going to talk about some work that is uh, ongoing. Um, so so the, the, you know, the, the, the first question I want to start with is if I go back to this picture of this building, um, and I want to answer this question. How much does the building cooling load drop over the course of a day if I increase the temperature set points in all the non-critical zones in the building by two degrees Fahrenheit? And why is answering that question not so trivial? The, the building's cooling load is a function of uh, occupancy in the building. It's a function of the building's physical characteristics. It's a, a function of the weather outside. It's a function of the building's control systems. All these things interact to determine the building's cooling load on a given day, which is why if I say I want to change temperature set points, I want to change the control set points in parts of the building, you know, in, in a subset of zones of the building for a given day, how does that impact chilled water load? That's not, uh, that's not so easy to do. We, know we don't have so good models to do that. So our solution was uh, to do what we called stress tests, to e essentially experiment, you know, perturb the building, see how it reacts. So here I'm showing you some data from the Packer building, which is on the engineering quad. The, in the picture here, the y-axis shows uh, the daily served cooling load for the building. So each dot is one day's worth of data. That's how much uh, chilled water, uh, how much en cooling energy is being taken out of the chill, chill water loop from Stanford on a daily basis. And the, x-axis is average daily temperature measured at the Stanford weather station. You know, so when, when it's hot outside, we consume more. And the blue dots correspond to uh, my low cooling set point, 74. The red dots, two degrees higher. This, so the difference between the blue dots and the red dots uh, is what I was trying to measure, the impact of increasing the temperature set points. And here I did it in 173 of the 229 zones uh, in the building. I, I just did it in part of the building, the part that was non-critical. Um, and I have uh, you know, the, the reason why I have uh, little dots and little processes, I'm differentiating weekdays and, and weekends there. The behavior is not quite the same on those days. Okay, so uh, when I do this for the Packard building, I measure uh, an impact of 20%. How do I do that? I, I estimate a linear regression for uh, a cooling load, y as a function of outside air, air temperature, uh, the set point change, whether it's a weekday or weekend, I can control for other things. And there are really two kinds of information I'm after here, two kinds of information that I think will be really important if we want to deploy this in the real world. One of them is that 20% number, you know, which is coming from the point 0.23 at the bottom, which is that uh, average impact that you get. The other one is the information that's contained in the second line, the standard errors. Why do I care about the standard errors? Because I want to have an idea of what's the uncertainty, what's the precision in my measurement. Because when I want to communicate that back to uh, the, energy, the district energy operators at Stanford or the grid operators outside, I want to have some idea of if I, if I do this, you know, multiple days, you know, how often is, is the system going to respond the way I want it to? Okay, so if we want to scale, you know, we've heard a lot about scale in other buildings, we need to do this in other places. The, the, I, my claim, you know, and you can talk more about it in the discussion, is the way I was testing these buildings is scalable, and sort of proof for why I think it's scalable, I tested 10 buildings in, so the, uh, we, we did this over three summers. First summer we tested three buildings, the second six, the third summer 10. All of this using roughly the same software, you know, the same team, and we were able to sort of double, almost double our experimentation test bed every year. And so here I'm showing you just the, those percent impact, uh, you know, the dots are the percent impact that I, that I, for chill water reduction from a two degree Fahrenheit set point increase or a four degree Fahrenheit set point increase. That's what the green and the orange dots are about. So the dots are the average set points, and the, uh, the, the, width, you know, the little bars there, that's my estimated 95% confidence interval, which gives me an idea of the precision of these estimates. So what do I see here in, in these? So here I'm showing you data from 10 buildings. I see that the buildings respond differently. You know, some of them give me more than others. There, there's a significant, you know, the 95% the confidence interval doesn't cover zero in most cases. In other words, there's a real impact in most of these buildings from what I would say is a modest temperature set point adjustment. Two degrees Fahrenheit is not a very, you know, is not a very big set point adjustment. In, why do I have different responses? Some of the buildings are labs. That's, for example, Mikolo and Baron here is a physics lab. You know, so there, there I have smaller impacts because I'm controlling a smaller fraction of the building. A big part of the load is for other things. In a building like the Havas building, you know, a lot of that is cool down air. So that has pretty big impact when I'm doing it. Um, there's also a difference depending on whether I do, you know, when I go from two degrees to four degrees. In some buildings, I have a sort of saturation effect. You know, the building doesn't respond more than it did before. In other cases, you know, I do double the set point. I get double the impact. 
So, you know, so all these buildings are different, but the idea here is that by testing them, by testing them repeatedly, I should say, we, we can measure that. You know, we, 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 can, uh, we can figure out how the building will respond on, uh, you know, given, you know, while control, all this is controlling for outside air temperature, it's controlling for weekday weekend effects, you know, different things there. So um, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but we also measured temperature in every part of the building, you know, in each of the different zones when we we're doing this to measure impacts to occupants uh, and you know, how are we measuring impacts to occupants here by how much the temperature was changing. So uh, the, the, I can go more into this in the discussion section. The, uh, these little bars here are representing different parts of the building. It's basically a temperature distribution throughout the building and how is that t temperature distribution shifting when I do these adjustments. One of the points I want to make here is the y-axis there is, uh, you know, just goes up to two degrees uh, Fahrenheit when I said these adjustments were either two or four. In other words, and this is one of the important findings here, when I increase the temperature set point by two or four degrees Fahrenheit, the temperatures in the building don't go up by two or more four degrees Fahrenheit. They go up by less than that. You know, and that sort of simple observation, which uh, I think to you know, some people in the buildings industry is obvious, to me coming into this was not obvious. You know, why that would be the case is actually driving a lot of uh, my current research on this topic, and I'll come back to that in a second. But first, I wanna zoom out a bit, and you know, so th those experiments, that data I was looking at, I was looking at what was the value of flexibility at the level of the Sanford campus? You know, what was the value of flexibility to build less infrastructure? So the data I'm showing you here, that's uh, what I'm calling, a, what I would call a load duration curve for Stanford. So here uh, I'm showing total chilled water demand for the entire campus measured at the central energy plant that provides energy to the whole campus. Um, so every day's worth of data stacked from worst to, e to, to, to easiest left to right. Okay, and the reason people make these low duration curves is, you know, depending on how steep the curve comes in when you go to the, uh, to the y-axis there, uh, that tells you that there's a lot of infrastructure you're using for a small number of days. You know, and so it also tells you that if you had the opportunity to be flexible on your demand on a small number of days per year, you could reduce your uh, infrastructure requirements. So, you know, there, there's a, I'm, I'm glossing all over a lot of detail, but the, the sort of the, the key number that comes out of uh, in this case, three years of work, is we think that if you had a demand response program like this at Sanford where you increase the temperature set point by, you could increase the temperature set point by two degrees Fahrenheit fewer than 10 days per year, you, you know, you, you, well, I guess, sorry, the way I'm phrasing it here is without that program, you would need 15% more infrastructure than with it. You know, in other words, uh, 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 modest adjustments here significantly reduce uh, infrastructure needs. Okay, so uh, next I wanna zoom back down a bit um, so, and, and, and uh, this is tugging a bit on what I was saying about the temperatures don't go up by two degrees when I, or four degrees, you know, not even close to four degrees when I increase the temperature set point. And one of the things that we also found when we look at this zone level data, this is why, you know, I think it's so rich to have uh, a zone level data, is a lot of the zones are not at their cooling set point. So here what these pictures for four of the buildings I showed earlier, uh, these four pictures are showing the difference, the, the median of the, different, of the difference between the temperature in the zone and the cooling set point. So the temperature the zone is actually at and the temperature it wants, you know, the maximum temperature it's allowed to be at. So something that's negative here means the building, the, the zone is cooler than, uh, than, it, I mean, than it wants to be or than it's allowed to be. And so what this shows you is that most, and, and the x-axis here is just zones. So the, what this is showing is most zones in these buildings are, uh, what I would say, are overcooled. You know, they're, they're colder than they could be. And, because, and this is data from May to October of 2023. You know, so the, the temperature outside is hotter than the set point most times, you know, in, in, in the times that I'm, average, that I'm uh, taking the median over here, right? And so uh, what you see actually is that there's, you know, depending on, on the building, again, it varies, but there are a few zones that are right at their cooling set points. Then there are, you know, quite a few that are, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle, and then there are quite a lot, they're, they're, you know, they're, these lines sort of saturate. And that's actually typically a lot of zones are right at their heating set point, which means, you know, in the summer, the heating is actually turned on to make sure that the buildings don't, you know, that those zones don't get too cold. So, you know, that, that's the first finding. A second finding, which is related to this, is we find that a small number of spaces, you know, when we ran these experiments, you know, after the fact, what we did is we, we, we used some models to try to understand how much energy was being used zone by zone and how much of the flexibility I measured, you know, those, you know, when I told you there's 30% impact in uh, Havas, how much is that coming from each of the zones? And what we find is that a small number of these spaces account for a large fraction of energy consumption and 
a, another small fraction of zones, which is not exactly the same set of zones, it, uh, accounts for a large fraction of the energy reduction. You know, so in other words, there's a small number of zones that plays a disproportionate role in determining the building's energy uh, behavior. Okay, and so this is what's bringing us to this uh, new research project that, that, you know, that we started uh, about a year ago, um, which we're, we're calling Seeker. And Seeker is about finding what we're calling these, you know, so the, at this point, this is still a hypothesis, you know, and we want to do more tests to you know, test the hypothesis and see if this is true. But so there are two ideas I gave you there. One, there's strong heterogeneity within uh, the buildings. There's also strong heterogeneity from building to building. And inside the buildings, a small number of spaces uh, plays this, what we think is a dominant role. So you know, our, our proposal you know, with, this, with Seeker is to find these dominant zones using data-driven models and experiments. And to tell you a bit more about you know, why uh, we think this is happening, you know, the, the, my summary schematic here is there, there's a small number of zones that are at their cooling set point. You know, so they're always too hot, uh, and, and they're trying to cool down. Okay? And so they're making requests to the central system in the building to get colder air or more air. And then there's a large, you know, there's another set of other zones, you know, what we're calling dominated zones here, the ones in blue, that are at their minimum airflow. You know, because they're, in each of these zones, you have, you have actually two sets of constraints. You have a, a dead band for uh, uh, heating and cooling, and, and, you know, for temperature, and you have a dead band for ventilation. So a lot of these zones are actually at minimum airflow, and that's why they're overcooled, is the temperature that, you know, the temperature is central. There's one temperature that's common to everyone, but the airflow is the, the part that you control. So, you know, what, what's the kind of solution you could have, you know, for, for if you could find these zones, you know, for a, a dominant zone, you could relax that constraint by increase the cooling set point if, you know, you don't need it. You could reduce this zone priority, again, if, if that's just sort of, this, the system wasn't set up right, you know, those are cheap fixes, or more expensive is a retrofit. You augment cooling capacity to that zone if you really need it. For the dominated zones, there's actually a lot of research that points to the fact that there's you know, a lot, you know, too much ventilation actually in these spaces because the way the, a lot of these parameters, humidity, temperature, uh, uh, ventilation are set, are very conservative, are based on rules of thumb. For, for good, you know, they're, they're conservative for good reason. In many cases, we don't, have, you know, we don't have measurement. But if we have measurement, we can relax those constraints and make them more specific. Okay, do I have a few more minutes? Okay, so. Uh, why can't you know? Why can't we do this all with data? You know, so so, so far I've talked mostly about uh, data-driven models, and my talk was supposed to be about data and physics. Um, so there's a lot we can do with data. You know, and, and and the the purpose of what I just talked about was to try to say that there's a lot we can do with data because the there we have distributed sensors and actuators, and they're cheap, and we can use them to gather data and you know in these stress tests. Basically, you perturb the building and you see how it responds. But th so there's a first constraint, which is experiment budgets are limited. You know, so for the, all the data I showed you before, that corresponds to roughly 1,200 experiment days. You know, if I look at all the buildings that I tested in a given summer, you know, if there are three months of summer at Sanford, I get maybe 90 days of tests. You know, so each, if, if each day is a separate test, that's not you know, so many tests if I want to test different conditions, which is partly, you know, part of the reason why you know, the questions I was asking were pretty simple. What happens if you know, across many of those experiments, I was keeping the set of zones fixed and saying, I'm gonna bump up the temperature set point by two degrees Fahrenheit in that fixed set of zones, and I'm gonna do it again and again. Why? Because then I, then I can measure those confidence intervals. I can measure that uncertainty. But what if I wanna change the set of zones in which I'm taking action? What if I wanna change the set point? What if I wanna do differentiated set points? All of that is hard. You know, it's, it's harder to extrapolate with just these data-driven models. And so the, you know, the, the, my idea here is that the, these, you know, these models are never going to be enough. Why are they never going to be enough? Because these commercial buildings, you know, I think in co strong contrast with uh, many industries where AI is really taking off, these buildings are always going to be data poor. And why are they always going to be data poor? Because when you're looking at the, you know, you could think of these data-driven models as input-output models. The, the problem is the inputs are never changing. You know, the, 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 what's going in, you know, the controls of the building, the set points that they want to be at, those are very rarely changed in practice. So yes, there's a lot of data that I can collect from sensors in the buildings that I have, but many of those data are telling me the same thing. You know, the one thing that's changing is the temperature outside and occupancy. Actually, you know, so those, those two things are changing, but the controls of the building are not changing. And so that, you know, that, that's always going to be hard. So that's why we launched this uh, this other project, uh, which we're calling No Calibration Building Models, which is saying, okay, you know, there's actually been decades of work on these physics-based simulation models. 
can we create tools to harness that, you know, all that knowledge that we have about, because we know how the physics work inside the building. We already have a lot of that knowledge, so we can take that and the data that we're collecting and sort of uh, uh, put them together to create new, better models that can do the extrapolation I was talking about. So I won't go into this in too much detail, but the sort of, you know, the, the status quo, you know, what we're doing today is you have a lot of human effort to build these models, and they're mostly used for design. You know, and by design, I mean construction and retrofits. What we, you know, where do we want to go? We want to go to a place where you start augmenting, you know, basically part of the tasks that are being done by humans, which are very time intensive here, are being replaced by, you know, the data and, uh, and learning algorithms. And then uh, if we can do that, you know, and we can tune these models for operations, then we can use them for both design and operations. And I just wanted to say, quick, so the, in, you know, in, in, in this work that we're looking at, you know, we're, I'll just go quickly to say, um, here I'm showing you some data for the temperatures in one of the building, both the measured data and simulated data from a measure that we calibrated to replicate this overcooling phenomenon. And you know, once I've trained this model, now I can use it to ask these what if questions of what if you know, I change things. Okay, and uh, just to bring it back to here, you know, I wanna say that this was about uh, design and operations of, of, uh, of these buildings. And you know, I said something about moving from planning to implementing the transition. Uh, I think we really want to have measurement-based models if we wanna do that. The tools that I want to use are these ones, distributed sensors and actuators, automated feedback control systems, uh, opt software uh, optimization uh, uh, and modeling. Why these tools? Because they're cheap. And, and you know, they're already cheap and they're getting cheaper. And I'll stop here. Awesome. Thanks. And yeah. Um, in general, the work that we are focused on is really thinking about how can we shift the gold standard in building cooling where instead of using mechanical cooling, we first optimally leverage natural resources that we have available to cool our building. And only if that isn't sufficient anymore, we introduce mechanical cooling. Most of the work that I'll show here was done by my group, by a graduate student, Chen Chen, but then in ongoing work, it's a collaboration with um, Sarah Billington, Rishi Jain, and, and Gabrielle wong Perori. So the motivation for our work is cooling is the fastest growing use of energy in buildings. The graph that you see here shows um, a projection of the increase in air conditioning units in the world um, up until 2050. So we're at more than 5 billion units if we want to provide cooling to everyone that will need it. Um, in terms of energy consumption, that translates to um, and more than tripling of um, energy use for cooling by 2050 if we don't address the energy efficiency of our cooling systems. In addition, these effects are reinforced by a feedback loop because you can imagine that not all of the energy needed for cooling is going to come from renewable energy. So the cooling is basically further heating up our world and we're gonna need more cooling. So why is natural cooling a solution? Um, it uses naturally occurring diurnal temperature variations between daytime and nighttime. And the resulting forces that you have because of natural wind and because of buoyancy to bring cool air indoors. So the video that you see there is um, a simulation for the Y2E2 building on campus, which uses a nighttime cooling system. So at night you open windows, you open louvers on top, you bring in cold air and you cool down the building structure. In addition to saving energy, we also know that the use of natural ventilation and cooling can improve well-being, health, and productivity. There has been a consistent association found between the use of air conditioning and then the increased prevalence of one or more symptoms of the sick building syndrome. Okay, so that brings me to our goal, right? We want to use natural cooling whenever it's possible. And then of course, we acknowledge that you can't do this always in all climates, right? So when needed, you're gonna resort to mixed mode systems and introduce mechanical cooling. Now the challenge with natural cooling is um, related to some of the points that Jacques actually touched on, and that is how do we design and implement these systems in a robust way? And the reason that it's challenging to make sure that these are robust is that they depend on factors that are um, very variable. Right, so natural cooling, the ventilation flow that you're going to get and the cooling that you're going to get requires knowing the outdoor wind and the outdoor temperature and that changes over time. 
It also requires knowing the indoor temperature, and that is dependent on things like how many people are there in the building, how many computers are you running, how many lights are on, et cetera. Okay, so we call these the aleatoric uncertainties. These are inherent to our problem. We are not going to get rid of this, right? So whenever we do design, we need to take these into account and make sure that our system can be robust over all of these uncertainties. The other challenge with natural cooling that is very different from mechanical cooling is that we're actually dealing with complex flow and heat transfer physics, right? So this is turbulent airflow, um, turbulent heat transfer. And in order to model that, you're going to have to make some assumptions. And those assumptions lead to what we call epistemic uncertainty. So these are model uncertainties because of the assumptions that we have to make in our model. So our goal is to establish validated modeling frameworks with uncertainty quantification that will really help us to um, design robust natural cooling systems. But then that also can support operation, right? Because just like Jacques said, if you use all these models during design, why don't you use them during operation to do the control of the building? Okay, so the way we think about this is to think about the design phase of these buildings as having some initial design where you're exploring different concepts and you might not have time to do very expensive computational modeling. Right? So at that point, you want some, a fast, robust model that uses uncertainty quantification to assess how your different designs will perform. So on the left hand here, you're going to have uncertain inputs. So what are the wind conditions at the site? What are the outdoor temperature conditions? Um, you'll also have uncertainties in the models here, right? Because the model that I'm using here is going to be something like an energy plus model. And I have to put in heat transfer coefficient, natural ventilation flow rates, et cetera. We don't know those. So all of this is on the left-hand side. We're going to propagate this through that energy plus model or even a more simple thermal model if you want. Um, to get and then run a number of evaluations so that we can get predictions for the temperature distributions with confidence intervals. Okay, and we can see which designs will be able to perform robustly and which not. Now then when you go to the detailed design phase, all of the uncertainties here might result in quite wide confidence intervals and you might want to reduce those. And that's where computational fluid dynamics come, comes in. So with computational fluid dynamics, you're getting a much more detailed solution for the flow field and the temperature field. And you can actually improve these correlations that you have in energy plus for heat transfer coefficients for natural flow rates, et cetera. Okay, so why not just use the CFD model here? Well, because we can't afford running a very large number of CFD simulations, right? The computational budget would become very high. So instead, we're going to use a lower number of CFD simulations to improve these thermal models and continue to use these um, during that detailed design phase. Then, of course, at that point, you have a model that you can also use to support operational control. OK, so our main goal has been to work on validation of these models and show that they really work. And in the remainder of this talk, I'm going to focus on how we did that for um, the CFD simulations specifically. So the test case that we've been using is the Y2E2 building on Stanford's campus, and it uses a buoyancy-driven um, nighttime cooling. So between 8 p.m. and 5 a.m., the natural cooling system becomes active. It's enabled when the indoor temperature is higher than the set temperature outdoors, and when, um, than, the, than the set temperature, and also when it's higher than the outdoor temperature. So whenever the system is activated, it opens windows um, on the different floors, and then it opens two of the louvers on top of these four atria that you see here. Okay, and here you see the inside of the atria, right? So you can see how they allow airflow from each of the floors up through the louvers and out. It's disabled when your temperature indoors reduces below a lower set point temperature. We have several years of building temperature measurements available, and that was um, one of the reasons that we picked this building, right? There's really like decades of data that we can use for validation, or so we thought, as I'll get back to later. Okay, so this is just to show you um, the actual flow that we're going to be looking at. So on floor one, we have a window in the back here. Floor two, we have two windows on this side and two on this side. On floor three, it's the same. And then on top, you have the louvers. So this is um, just showing you some time into the nighttime ventilation. So you have cold air coming in through these windows. 
Um, you have a strong stratification, right, because the hot air rises. And interestingly, you get that volume of hot air above the louvers that is actually not really getting out, but that is stuck there because of the stability. You see on floor one, floor two, and floor three that you really get these cold jets of air coming in, right? And then that gradually starts cooling the space. But you see a strong non-uniformity in these temperatures in the space. Yeah? So the next one just shows you um, these videos again. So this is the one that you saw before. So you have cold air coming in, it drops down, it starts to fill the atrium, the lower spaces first, right? And then that start, the warm air is leaving and gradually you cool the entire building. Now, if you look at the floor plan, this is on floor two, and I'll play this video as well. This is where our building sensor is that we were gonna use for validation of our models. Okay, and when you play this, you see these two jets of air coming in, they drop down so you don't see them in this plane, but then you see how they start to fill the space with cold air. And clearly on average, this space is cooling much faster than our building sensor, right? So we had been doing about half a year of work of simulations and validation. We're like, why do we keep seeing faster temperature decreases than our measurements are reporting? Well, it's just related to the, where the building sensors are. And this is not only important for validation of our models, but this is also important for control, right? Because where you put your sensors is then gonna determine your control. Okay, so a key challenge for validation and control is that we should try to get measurements that are representative of the average air temperature in our space and not just at one location that I don't know who decided, right? <laughs> um, okay, so we went to do a design of experiments and then do our own experiments so that we could get data for validation. So we wanted to determine optimal sensor placement so that we could get measurements that are representative of the volume average temperature and also measurements that represent a spatial variability because you might not only want to predict the average, right? You might also want to know where is the minimum and the maximum temperature or what, is that, what are those temperatures going to be. And then importantly, because if we're doing field experiments, we're not going to control the wind and the temperature, right? So we need to find the sensor location under the whole possible set of conditions that we might see during our experiment. Okay, so that brings us back to uncertainty quantification, right? We can look at historical data for the outdoor temperature and also for the indoor temperature at the start of the ventilation process, and we can then fit distributions, right, to what these parameters are going to be. Um, these distributions define the boundary conditions for our CFD simulations, and we're propagating these uncertainties using um, polynomial chaos methods. So we had to run 81 of these simulations here. And then we have a metric that tells us how representative are we of the average temperature, and also where do we find the minimum and the maximum temperatures most likely. And we're gonna look at these metrics in terms of the mean, right? We wanna find the ones where on average, we're gonna have the best representation of the, of the average temperature. But we also wanna look at the variance because we wanna find the ones where there's not gonna be too much deviation depending on the outdoor conditions. I'm not gonna go into the details of, the, um, of how we define the metric, but this shows you these plots, right? So um, high values here means that we have strong deviations of the average temperature. Um, High values here means that there is a strong um, difference in the metric depending on the outdoor conditions that we see at the time. So you wanna put your sensor where this one is low and where this one is low, but because it means that under all possible conditions, we're gonna have a really good representation of the volume average temperature. Okay, so after all this work, we did our measurement campaign. And we had 20 indoor measurement locations measuring air temperature and then also floor, wall, and ceiling temperatures. The outdoor temperature came from the building sensor and wind speeds come from the Stanford weather station. We did these experiments during um, eight nights. So you have just uh, um, the initial temperature difference here um, between indoor and outdoor, the wind speed, and then this fruit number kind of gives you the balance in the importance of wind versus buoyancy in the ventilation process. And because we weren't modeling wind in these simulations, we focus on ones where um, buoyancy is clearly the dominant process. Okay, one of the things that we did is we decided to divide the building in different zones. So we 
made sure that we measured volume average temperatures for each of these five zones at our sensors. And then we could compare those. But here I'm going to focus just on the floor average temperatures um, just for brevity. So what you see is zone one is where our building sensor is, right? This is what we measured. And then the, the magenta shows you what the building sensor measured. And then you see the average temperature on the floor too. And there's a 1.6 Celsius difference, right, between these two. So that is really, really significant. Okay, so now with our new measurements, we can go back and try to validate our CFD. We again do an uncertainty quantification process because when we run the CFD simulation, we have to specify an outer temperature. There's an uncertainty on that measurement. We have to specify the thermal mass temperatures. There's uncertainty on those measurements as well. And then the internal loads is something else that we have to put in the CFD model. So that is also something that is uncertain. So um, yeah, we set these uncertainties as false. We propagate them again with our polynomial chaos method. So we did 27 simulations. And then we can compare the mean temperature predicted by the CFD model with the confidence intervals to the measurements. And then this is what we get on floor one, floor two, and floor three. So um, the green is the average temperature in the experiment, the black line is a CFD, and the red with the confidence intervals are just the CFD showing the confidence intervals. Okay, and then this is the outdoor temperature decrease. So you clearly see that these models can do a very good job at predicting that average indoor temperature, but only if you have really representative measurements, right? Because when we started out and we used the building sensor for validation, this looked awful and we had no idea what was going on. Okay, so we believe that computational fluid dynamics and uncertainty quantification in combination with building energy models can support robust natural ventilation design and operation in three ways. First, we can support optimal sensor placement, right? And that's important for both model validation and for operational control. Second, we can inform design by predicting the indoor temperatures that you will see in your buildings with quantified confidence intervals. And we've shown that um, these really encompass full-scale measurements. And then third, we can, from the CFD, get very accurate flow rate and heat transfer correlations that can go into building energy models like Energy Plus and then make those predictions much more accurate. Okay, so we've shown that the model can work, but that doesn't mean that people are suddenly going to start using natural cooling, right? So what are we doing right now? So we have a project um, that is a, a collaboration um, where we are looking at eliminating all the other barriers to widespread uptake. And we see these um, in terms of the different stakeholders, right? So first you have the occupants that are either going to have to open and close their windows manually or that are going to have to be okay with a system doing it for them automatically. And second, we have the designers. It's not because we dream up the perfect model that the designer is going to be happy using it, right? You need to really um, work with them to get to a point where these are useful for design. And then last is existing building codes and standards, which currently do not promote or reward the use of natural cooling. They all allow for it, and they say that it is an allowable option to make sure that you get sufficient cooling, but there is really no um, yeah, promotion or rewarding for it. Okay, so how do we want to do this? So on one hand, um, we want to leverage sensor technologies and advanced control systems to design human-centric control systems that occupants will be happy with. Then we want to do co-design of our modeling tools with architects and engineers. And then lastly, we want to provide data to support small initial changes to codes and standards that will then hopefully result in feedback loops. Because once you have a few more buildings with natural cooling and you show that those actually work, it gives architects and engineers uh, much more credibility when they go to their clients to see, look, this is what we can actually do. So that's all I have. No. Yeah. So as a good moderator, I want to make sure we leave time for questions and discussion at the end, 15 minutes. So hey, Siri, set timer for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes, counting down. Uh, this is going to be quick, um, because I do want to leave time for discussion. I, I always feel a little bit awkward at energy, um, at energy uh, events, because you know, I, 
I'm a civil engineer and material scientist. Uh, and so um, uh, I always feel like I'm a bit of an imposter coming to these things. Um, but, um, but what I want to talk about is a lot of the materials work that we're doing uh, in, in CEE. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to the construction materials world if you're not familiar with it. Um, this is actually a picture of uh, EVGR, the graduate residence going up on campus, precast concrete. So, you know, the, the big things that we do um, uh, are, are, are either concrete uh, or asphalt. Uh, and so here we're looking at some, some slices of concrete uh, and some slices of asphalt. And I'll be honest with you, uh, the vast majority of construction materials are us gluing rocks together. That's pretty much what we know how to do. And we either use cementitious materials to bind local aggregates together, or we use fossil fuel derivatives, asphalt, to bind local rocks together. And, and this is a lot of what we do around the globe, whether it's building infrastructure, whether it's building structural systems, whether it's paving roads, whether it's creating cinder block, which is the construction technique for a lot of the world. And so in many regards, this is the problem that research in our group is trying to, uh, trying to address with a number of collaborators. Um, just for your information, um, concrete, uh, when you see the trucks going down the road spinning the big drum, that is not a cement truck. That is a concrete truck. Uh, concrete, of course, is um, a, a mixture of binder and aggregate. That's going to be ordinary, ordinary Portland cement concrete. Um, and it... Uh, we take our cement, uh, add a water to it, and it hydrates into a binder, which we then add to aggregate to get our concrete. Asphalt concrete, as it's known, um, is asphalt um, uh, plus uh, our aggregate, and asphalt is our binder in that case. So how big is this, uh, how big is this problem? This is non-fuel material use in the United States from 1900 to about 2015 in million metric tons. That gray is construction materials. This industry dwarfs everything that is done in our country. Um, around the world, it's even larger. Of course, what you can see is after World War II, the great expansion of our global infrastructure system, bridges, the, the national freeway system, the way we build everything here in the United States. And over the next 30 years, we will build this equivalent probably three times in China alone. That does not account for India. That does not account for Africa. We are going to be talking about massive amounts of materials that are going to be used around the globe. And these materials are very energy intensive. This is where my imposter syndrome gets relieved a little bit. Very energy intensive to produce. Just looking at CO2 emissions alone from cement production, um, about 26% of it is fuel combustion, 14% electricity and transport, and then 60% comes from calcination. That is driving CO2 off of limestone in order to make cement. When we talk about CO2 emissions from asphalt paving, the majority of it comes from heating the asphalt. We have to get it into liquid state so that we can then and also heating the aggregate that's within it to then lay it down as you've seen when you drive down the freeway and the paving crew is working and it all flows out very nicely. Uh, that comes off at a very hot temperature. <clears throat> In addition, there are huge waste flows associated with construction and demolition waste, the vast majority of which by mass are, are concrete. Um, and then uh, lots of other stuff that comes out of this. Uh, annual construction waste, waste by 2025 is expected to be about 2.2 billion tons. So how big is this problem? It's big. Okay. Um, when we talk about the scale of the material flows in terms of volume, this industry is 10 times larger than the entire fossil fuels industry. And so as we start to think about scalable solutions, 
where we think about where the fossil fuels industry is going to fit globally into a, a global economy that doesn't contribute to CO2, I see this as being a very, very important component of that because it is an alternative where you don't have to dominate the market. One-tenth of it is as big as you. So what are the kinds of things we're working on? We're working, and uh, full disclosure, this, this part of the work is sponsored by uh, ExxonMobil through SEA. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, uh, on looking at carbon negative buildings that are looking uh, to be constructed with polymeric um, um, resources. So we take waste CO2, turn it into monomers, like a polypropylene carbonate. We then pelletize that, can make a GFRP composite, create architectural elements and entire building facades. If you want to see what one of these looks like, this is an example that was made by one of our partners, Chrysler and Associates, using these kinds of materials. This is what the facade looks like at SF MoMA. Now, that didn't come from this recycled CO2, but those are the kind of waste streams that we're thinking of introducing in or completely redirecting fossil fuel uh, extraction towards these kinds of non-combustion uses. There are interesting circularity uh, questions to also be asked when we talk about using these materials for something like a building facade. One of the hardest parts of recycling plastics is the, very, is the highly varied waste stream different copolymerizations, different types of plastics. It's very difficult to economically get a plastics recycling stream going. The scale at which it needs to happen is also very hard. If we're taking entire buildings that are made of a single type of polymer that have never entered the municipal waste stream, we start to get to circularity that gets interesting. What are we also developing? Yes, lots of design tools, lots of computational tools to try to help all of our architects, engineers, contractors design with these materials and making sure that they have the durability uh, and the capability of passing fire code, passing building code, uh, passing all of the other things that are necessary to ensure that we have safe and reliable construction. Separately, we're also looking at completely different types of construction composites. Yes, we're still gluing rocks together, but we're gonna use much different glue. Here we're looking at the creation of biological binders. This is work that's going on uh, with NASA um, that was uh, specifically targeted for extraterrestrial construction, but we're now we're using it here. We now have complete demonstration. Uh, we have now complete methodologies to design construction materials using biological binders, not asphalt, not cement, that have compressive strengths and durabilities that are similar to ordinary reinforced concrete. What kind of biological binders do we use? We use derivatives from the food production, um, uh, the waste derivatives from food production. We're using uh, lignin, waste lignin, highly unprocessed waste lignin in order to serve as our binder. Um, once again, that's work that's being sponsored through SEA by Shell. They have lots of lignin from biofuels production. What do we do with it? we can make all kinds of construction materials with it. Uh, we also are designing some uh, of these binders based on the uh, proteins that the feet of barnacles and mussels use to stick in the tidal zone, because we know that's a really good way to hold on to inorganic particles. The construction materials we're creating are perfectly circular, meaning you create, you, you mix them at scale. We use them we can then disassociate the composition, the different components, and we can recreate them. Yes, we need energy to make that circle go around, but the materials are never lost. Uh, and working with bioengineering, we're now specifically designing proteins, starches, and other types of biological glues that will increase the properties uh, of these materials. We, pre we 3D print these things. We're, we're starting now to do these, uh, do these types of demonstrations uh, at scale. We're scaling to the next set of building technologies up. We're demonstrating different bio-inspired proteins. We're looking to develop complete ontologies of new types of binders that we can use that will completely replace cement and asphalt globally. 
uh, and, uh, and, and we continue to look for, for funding um, uh, and have been successful in getting funding. So here we're looking at um, uh, the 3D printing uh, of some of our materials. And then below, these are two demonstration housing units that we built in collaboration with NASA to uh, support the Artemis missions for the return to long-term uh, visits to the moon uh, for astronauts. So uh, I want to thank SEA, uh, Stanford Energy, Precourt, and of course uh, ExxonMobil and Shell for their support and their very, very good collaboration. Gus is great. Uh, Robbie at Shell is fabulous. Um, and uh, I can't thank them enough for both their support and their collaboration. So with that, uh, I'm going to ask our... Oh, I'm sorry. So with that, I'm going to ask our... Uh, our two speakers to come back up to the front. Oh, and if you want to see the biologically bound stuff, you can touch this too, right? As an experimentalist, I get to bring uh, show and tell stuff. So while you're getting some questions, uh, some questions uh, together in the, the audience, uh, I want to ask both of you uh, a, a question um, <clears throat> that maybe our attendees can help with. And maybe it's a problem, maybe it's not. Um, both of you in the work that you highlighted are using Stanford buildings as the example. University buildings are interesting in the way that they're used. Um, we learned this when we created the energy model for Y2E2 using very standard models and found that, oh, students don't work from 9 to 5. They work from... 9 to 5, but 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., right? Um, is there a downside and a limitation to the research by using university buildings, and further, university buildings that exist within a climate that is very unique in its temperature ranges and its humidities year-round? And are there opportunities there? You want to start, Catherine? Sure. Um, I think the limitations are depend on what you're trying to do, right? In our case, if you're focusing That's a on... a great professor answer. It always depends. I love it. <laughs> right. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> In our case, if you're focusing on validation of the models, it doesn't matter that right. much. If I validate the model in this building, I have a lot of confidence that it's going to work in a number of other buildings. Yeah. Now, if we start to do our research that I was talking about for like occupants and designers and policy, right? We need to move away from using university buildings and that's what we're doing as well. So for that project, we're thinking about looking at different classes of buildings. So single family homes, multifamily housing, and then commercial buildings. And we'll go off campus to do that work with occupants and, and others that are off campus. Um, so yes, if we can have more off-campus buildings to do this, that's great. Doing what we did, though, putting like these 20 sensors up in the building during night, like, would be hard to sure. talk to someone in a commercial building and, and yeah, get approval to do that. Yeah. So it's a balance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Use it where it's good, sure. and otherwise move on. What do you think? Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is, you know, before talking about the limitations of the buildings mm -hmm. at Stanford. You know, to me, one of the benefits is that they exist, and you know, and, and that we can run experiments in them. And, and accessibility and, is yeah. incredibly important. And, and to me, that you know is sort of sure. hard to beat. And um, you know, and, and I don't see so many test beds out there where you can do the sorts of experiments that Catherine was talking about, or the ones that I talked about. Um, so you know, but but I think this can only be a starting point. You know, it's sort of like we had, we had zero. You know, uh, running experiments somewhere is a start. We need to run them, run them elsewhere. I think there's, you know, the question of how applicable is the research that we do. You know, I think that's always a question. Um, the in the commercial sector, I would actually argue a lot of the buildings that you see on university campuses are uh, uh, relatively representative. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, we don't have warehouses. Uh, we do have places with the, you know, d data centers. Uh, we have offices. We have conference centers. We have a museum. Um, you know, we, we there is a variety. You know, like a var variety mm -hmm. of buildings type. You know, building types, ages, systems. 
Um, so you know that the, that part I, I wouldn't be so worried about mm -hmm. for and for elsewhere. So you know, and actually, you know, I, I, I maybe this is you know the time for me to put a plug for a student working with me who is doing a poster tonight, um, who did some experiments in the um, Exxon. Uh, corporate he uh, headquarters, you know, so different uh, buildings. New Jersey so, is very different. <clears throat> so New Jersey and Houston, actually. Okay. Both. And so, well, so there's a poster session tonight yeah. where you can, you know, learn about that. That's great. And, um, you know, and, and so they're different, you know, much more humid climate. So Houston, much more humid climate than here. Uh, Pierre, humidity doesn't, you know, we worry about humidity, but really it doesn't matter so <laughs> much over here compared to there. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think there are pros and cons, but again, to me, the big benefit is they exist. A absolutely. I'm going to open the floor to questions if some exist. So yeah, go ahead. So a follow-up on that question. Yeah. Um, a lot of um, uh, electricity tariffs now are basically ton of use. And so the, the, the company pays more during the 4 to 9 p.m. and also residential. And I, I, have been, I don't know how Stanford charges for their thermal, district thermal, but I kind of would doubt that it's ton of use. Okay, so um, one thing that Berkeley Labs has done is pre-cooling. So basically during the night when the tariff is less or during the day when there's a lot of solar on the grid, you want to reduce your carbon, you pre-cool the building, and then at night you increase and decrease. What do you think about that as a control strategy? I mean, that's exactly I what can... you do at nighttime exactly. cooling, right? <laughs> so yes, I think. so. I didn't answer the climate question, right? But there are climates when purely natural cooling is not going to work. But you can think about doing things like that to at least decrease like the peak demand, right? It similarly leverage the thermal mass that a building has, and you pre-cool that and use that later. So I, yeah, I think it's a very viable. And in a climate as cold as Berkeley, <laughs> <laughs> that can work, right? And um, maybe just to comment a bit more on the specific Stanford. So Stanford doesn't have time of use, but we have, we have what's called direct access to the California independent system operator. So we pay a real time price and a demand charge. It's the, those are basically the two big components. In the Stanford system, I would actually argue, I think pre-cooling is not the first thing you'd go, I mean, we have gone after. Why? Because we have, we have what's called an electrified uh, district energy system. So the, the thermal utilities are almost all electric. And in, so there's a central plant which uh, represents up to 45% of the power we consume, 20% of the energy over the course of the year. And, that, you know, and, and th those loads are very, very controllable. And we have big thermal storage tanks. I encourage you to go visit the building if you haven't. It's, it's, it's nice to see. And these big thermal storage tanks, that's our battery. And with that, we can do a lot of this shifting around. And we do a lot of this shifting around that you talk about. And that's much, much easier to do at that scale than, uh, uh, than in the buildings. You know, I, the research I was talking about is actually, can we do more in the buildings? But uh, uh, yeah, I, in, you know, I think in a non-district energy system, the answer is different. Yeah. Amy? It, so um, given the size of the problem, especially even if you just look at the US, so you guys are, have some pretty detailed approaches <clears> that you're developing <throat> to make the case and demonstrate the models and so on, but how do you get commercial buildings to start trying stuff now, even before they would have? the right sensors and the right models for that building, because given the mm -hmm. energy use now, right, they could, they're getting commercial buildings to try things even without all the maybe control and so on, and, could save energy until they have yeah. the more detail. And I guess if I, can, if I can maybe add to the question or change it, what do you think is the biggest barrier to implementing it now? Yeah, right, or, or try to, to yeah, model, but even right. a anything. Model, yeah, I, I right. I mean, I actually think, you know, maybe you can talk more about this, but the, the, one of the things that you were talking about is something I've been thinking a lot about uh, when you were talking about optimal sensor placement. You know, so like, one, like so, you know, if one of the things I said, we, I saw in the experiments I ran, is it looks like a small number of zones actually matters a lot more than the others. Right. Okay, well, if you can find those zones without having all the sensors, and if you could, you know, determine where to place you know, the smallest set of sensors to get you, you know, you know the sort of 80-20 uh, uh, out of the building, then I think things can go much, much faster in, in those buildings you talk about, which, you know, it, it, the, the number actually, you know, I think it's sort of like 12% or of commercial floor space in the U.S. has programmable thermostats. You know, so we, we don't, you know, most buildings don't have a lot of sensors. Uh, you know, so the, what you describe is, is, the, is not the exception. It's the norm. The sensors everywhere, that's the exception. Catherine, what do you think? Anything to add? Um, I think, yeah, there, one is kind of the, the working with building operators, right, um, to understand 
if they would do things like increase the set point temperature, which is extremely easy to do, right? And it's very unlikely that your building occupants would complain about it. Um, so <laughs> I think there are some very easy fixes, but yeah, we, you need that stakeholder interaction, right? Which is where we're trying to get at for the natural cooling as well. <coughs> the other thing, and I'm not an expert at all on that, which is why the project is a collaboration, is I think policy. If you start to have, yeah, things like, if you increase your set point temperature by two degrees, like you get rewarded for it, like who wouldn't do it at that? So one of the things that I heard Jacques mention was cost of labor and cost of installation. Yeah. And, and maybe I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> reveal myself as a much more laissez-faire, less policy uh, optimist. Um, and and you know when I hear cost, putting on my finance hat, I hear initial cost is not a problem. Financing is a problem at that point because you can borrow money to cover initial costs. The incentives are not aligned for 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 private industry to do this at this point. And policy is a way to get interests forced rather than aligned. And 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 so, you know, in in some regards, I think it's unfortunate that that we don't talk more about what some of the financial innovations and products will need to be to make some of this stuff happen at a rate that needs to happen. Um, in some regards, I want to see Jamie Dimon here next year to talk about how we get innovation in that space. How do we get all of those real estate owners, users, occupiers to, to have interests aligned financially? Can I add something to that real quick? Sure. So and, uh, I think so. Uh, part of the issue, I think, is you know, it, which really has to do with in the incentives that you were talking about, is that that today, you know, I think, and sort of savings from energy operations, they don't, you know, people don't do it. You know, so I, I think it's not enough. You know, it's it's not a justification that people take to do these retrofits. And I think part of that is the big decisions that are made in buildings are infrastructure investments, and you know, and so how do you tie the you know, I'm going to better operate the building and so it's going to save me on my infrastructure investment. I think that part is hard. One of the reasons it's hard, one of the incentives that I think is difficult, is, uh, I, I went to a uh, real estate conference uh, to learn about this sort of stuff last November. One of the things I learned, which I think is very relevant to this, is many of the, of the large commercial buildings, the ownership flips actually pretty fast. You know, it's like on a five year time scale. So if you want to do an investment which is going to pay off right. in more than five years, you don't do it. But, and but, so, you know, like but, investing in natural ventilation is going to save you on your energy bill, but it's probably going to take a while before it pays off. And so connecting that, I think, is part of the challenge. Well, and also the triple net problem. The, triple net problem. the renters are responsible oh, yeah, for energy yeah, yeah. costs, not the owner yeah, of the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, uh, let's go to the back for just, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah, yeah and I used to work for the US Community Building Council, and again, this is just bringing back to that Hopefully not too much PTSD. <laughs> a little bit, but I mean, what we did find there was that the, invest, the real estate investors put pressure on the building operators mm -hmm. to um, design infrastructure for green standards because their investors want to see it. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you guys do any um, work with these uh, standards organizations or kind of loop into that with the work that you do and find any synergies in it. Yeah, so when I say policy, I mainly think about that, right? How can we get these things into uh, the California code, like Title 24, as being things that are actually like recommended and give you like credits toward having a green build? Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. In the, in the area of seismic safety, we dealt with similar problem, real estate, how do we yeah, it might keep somebody in my building, but it's very likely. So, eventually, ordinances came in. Loma Prieta came, and really some very visible disasters. And so we started putting some rules about how do you look at the building quickly and say, for $50, I can improve this building. Mm. For $5,000, I can improve it. And so you had some quick measure what you could do within your uh, small 
small portion of your operational budget that would make a difference. And what you have shown here, forget the sensors. We are still putting accelerometers on the buildings and the owner doesn't even know what the accelerometer is doing. But the owner knows that extra brace or extra bolt tying it to the foundation makes a big difference. So if you took what you just showed us today as a guidance, what minor changes you could make to a building to make a difference in the energy efficiency, that would be very exciting, I think, to owners. Sure. Well, one of the things I would add to that is that I don't think it was the owners that pushed that. It was the reinsurers that pushed that. It was the translation of seismic safety into a real insurance cost. And so if there is a mechanism by which energy savings in your building leads to lower mortgage payment, hmm. that becomes real. And every building owner knows what that means and how that gets translated. Um, and, and, and so you know, I, I think in, in this space where we talk so much about very large capital investments, whether it's materials, whether it's technology, uh, the, the, the fluidity of the discussion between the finance piece mm -hmm. and how we are going to achieve our goals is, is not yet strong enough. Last question. Go ahead. Yeah, Mark. Because uh, we talked about this model-based control, and you implemented it for about a week. Did you guys compare the uh, uh, like standard mechanical control to this new thing to kind of a difference in operational performance? or like the, the energy cost as an example, because if you can reduce the operational cost of the building, then you, you know, back to the point of increasing the NOI of the building, increasing the value of the building. You guys so we did experiments. We didn't change the control of the building itself. So we just measured the temperatures to be able to validate our model. In another research project, we did just model-based kind of investigate if you did do model predictive control instead of what they do now, right? Open the windows at 8 and close them when the temperature is low enough. If you could further save energy um, and um, keep the same level of user comfort, and you can Right? So if instead of just going from a set point control system to something that is model predictive, that thinks about what is the temperature going to be the next day, so what is the smartest decision, you could save a lot more energy. And you could start with, kind of going back to your question, you could start with very simple versions of model predictive control. Like you don't have mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. And then slowly improve. Uh, all right, so I have to bring this session to a close to be responsible. Uh, thank you so much for joining the panel.